Well, I'm really glad that as many people came out the first really nice spring evening and the film festival is going on. Um, we had intended to have a really interesting film about mouth harp in Siberia. Mouth harp is one of the key instruments that we'll look at tonight. But that DVD um, actually had an accident. It was on its way with a a plane load of wood bison to Alberta from <laughs> Yakutia. And uh, anyway, it didn't quite make it all the way uh, to our hands. But we will be able to uh, hear something of the Hatalayevs, uh, who are some of the world's uh, premier mouth harp musicians. So the, tonight, uh, what I'm going to talk about in this Musica Borealis series is about um, northern native music. And we're going to take a little survey. I have the CDs from which I've taken the music here. We'll go right around the north, and we'll look at some key traditions. And um, we're going to be looking at them um, as they have been recorded ethnographically. Many times those are the expectations that people have about music. Then we'll be looking at the way that music is being used today and a little bit of a peek at perhaps what that music will look like uh, in the future. So what we'll start with here like you to tune up your ears. And I'm going to play a little clip here. I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, but uh, we're going to return to it at the end, and perhaps you'll be able to identify it. So it's definitely circumpolar. <laughs> to this and to see if you can identify it. What I'm going to do tonight is we're going to look at a number of traditions. We'll go right the way around the circumpolar world and we'll start um, in the place where I've done most of my research in Finland, the Kalevala tradition in eastern Finland uh, actually. It's now part of uh, the Russian Federation but the Kalevala is one of the epic traditions that's quite amazing for its poetry and for its music and we'll look at a number of different motifs there. Then we'll go a little north in, Scand in the Fennoscandia Peninsula. We'll look at Yoik, which is the traditional singing style of the Sami people. And um, it is in many ways uh, very interesting and possibly comparable uh, to the blues. Uh, here the, the music of black Americans um, condemned for a good portion of um, Mod, the modern era, but coming back into its own, and also deeply rooted in uh, expressing a place or an emotion. Then we're going to go into Siberia and look at the Olan Hol. Um, you, maybe you've not seen this, but it makes a really great Scrabble word with all those uh, O's and um, the K and stuff. But Olan Hol is, uh, the UN has named it one of the world's um, uh, cultural uh, heritage and um, it is also an epic tradition and we'll see some of the music around that and some of that music involves the mouth harp and that'll take us to the Hatalayevs and some other uh, performers in Siberia. We'll look at two throat singing traditions. Some of you may have heard of Tuvan throat singing 
um, which is a very famous uh, way of uh, using your larynx as a, as a resonator. I'm not a musician and I'm not a musicologist. I can talk about the cultural traditions from which these arise, but um, I, you'll probably you can stump me pretty well about the, the music itself. But then we'll go and look at Inuit throat singing and where in tuba, throat singing is generally a, a solo performance. In the Inuit tradition, it's typically with two people um, using each other's uh, mouth cavities as the resonators. And the last thing that we'll end up with is drumming. And we could certainly look at drumming all around the circumpolar world, but we'll look, particularly look at Cree traditions. So here I have a map that kind of gives you a view of the circumpolar world. At the Center for Circumpolar Studies, we like to think of the world with uh, the North Pole really as the center. And I like this map quite a lot because it is drawn by one of the uh, people that you're going to hear from. Um, his name in Sami is Kevisjale, but his Norwegian name is Hans Ragnar Matteson. And one of the things that he does is there are no national names on here. There are no nations. There's no Canada. There's no uh, Russia. But there are all of the indigenous people and the areas that belong to them. So you can see Nunavut up there, for instance, or Kalalit Nunat for Greenland, and uh, Sapmi here. And you can see uh, the actual names of things. But we'll hear more about uh, Kevis Yelly later. Um, while I'm here, the theme that I'm using tonight is really uh, around the ideas of folk music coming from the folk, uh, belonging to them and coming from an oral tradition, and kind of morphing into an idea of world music. Um, there's a really interesting um, definition of world music, meaning that it's local, but it's not from here. <laughs> So it's something that is somewhere else in the world, but it's local to that. And then we've got fusion. And fusion is probably the thing that's uh, most interesting from this point of view, which means that it's local, but not from anywhere. Um, and that taking lots of traditions and take, putting them together. But I think you will see that as I go around that the, um, the um, characteristics that were present in the folk tradition carry right through into through world music and into fusion. So the first uh, place that we're going to go is to Karelia, easternmost Finland. Um, and the Kalevala tradition is quite uh, important there. One of the things about the Kalevala tradition is that the meter is the thing that runs everything. So you've got, an, uh, you've got four uh, sets, four iams. Vaka, vanha, vainer, merinin. It's the same pace that you see in Hiawatha. By the shores of Gitche The other thing that you have in the Kalevala tradition is that you have a uh, phrase and repeat with a slight variation. So you, saw, you see actually Longfellow doing that in Hiawatha, by the shores of Gitche by the shining big sea water. So one thing is a slight variant on the other. And you proceed by these slight variations. <clears throat> and the, this is for you, Bill. Um, the main instrument of that was the accompaniment to uh, the Kalevala was the Kantele. Um, there are a number of different versions of this stringed instrument, <clears throat> something like a dulcimer, um, but uh, there are five uh, string and I think 13 string, but you can't, you can't tune them, so you're uh, committed to whatever uh, the key is. And um, one of the really interesting things about the performance of the Kalevala epic is that uh, right into the beginning of the 20th century with uh, recording equipment is there were still people who knew uh, numerous runos, those are the actual uh, kind of sets of poems, and could recite them without uh, hesitation. So there are, and, that, and you will actually get a, pe uh, get a bit of that here. 
Um, this was recorded in 1922 and then reissued by the Finnish Literature Information Society. And um, that's a place you can go to and hear more about these things. So here we've got Ani Kirilov, and she is singing the part of the Kalevala that has to do with the creation of the Kantle. <laughs> play a little bit more in just a bit, but um, I think you can hear kind of these, uh, she'll go until she runs out of breath and then she takes a big breath and she doesn't necessarily in, stay in tune, but the meter is the thing that carries her along. There's no cantile accompaniment here, nor is there a call and response uh, singer. So typically if you had um, a Kalevala uh, big performance, you would have two singers because uh, to sing through these really long uh, runos, you need two of them. May I borrow you a minute? Can you come sure. up here? <laughs> and if you were singing, come closer to me, give me your hands like this, and you would actually, this, this hold is known as the Kalevala hold, and I would say, by the shores of Gichigumi, and you say, by the, sh by the shores of Gichigumi by the shining big sea water. And you'd actually rock to it. Oh. So, by the shores of Gichigumi. By the shores of Gichigumi. By the shining big sea water. By the shining big sea water. Yeah. So, um, you get that, that hold. And if you go to Finland, they still can find this uh, schematized on the back of, I think it's the 10 cent piece now that they're on the euro, but um, that hold that goes between them. And that stood for um, a lot of the, um, that motif of uh, call and response and uh, incremental change is something that you have. So let me play just a little bit more of Ani Kirilov here. move on to another variant of uh, the Kalevala. In this case, uh, I, um, this band no longer exists in military, but uh, several of the people in the band, this uh, Dimitri Diemen and Arto Rinne, are in several other bands. They'll actually be in Vermont this summer and have come to Vermont quite often. Um, and um, this, they come from Petroskoy, Petrozavodsk in Karelia, where um, the dominant population still is Russian, but there is a minority Karelian population. And one of the really curious phenomena of the Soviet Union was that they supported folk culture. And the idea was that you could kind of take folk culture and separate it and make it into its own little um, um, cultural heritage that then would not infect the, the true homo sovieticus. It wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, involve that. So if you took folk music and you put it in the archives and you let people perform it in very constrained spaces, that was considered safe. It's very curiously, those of you with any Baltic heritage remember that, uh, that the singing revolution was part of what brought the Baltics to independence. And we also see that the um, perpetuation of kind of cultural performances in the uh, for former Soviet Union um, is one of the things that is around national um, identities. 
So um, this group, um, they studied together at uh, the University of Petrozavodsk, and um, they were able to use the archives similar to the ones that I was just uh, playing from, going back to that, and they spent a lot of time looking at those materials and then figuring out how to perform them, often with just really faulty or very uh, limited uh, audio recordings and uh, handwritten notes. But um, here we go, and this is uh, about Vyinermerinin. Vyinermerinin is the key, kind of the, the hero of the Kalevala, and he um, is a musician. And uh, one of the things that he does is during this terrible storm, he has a fight with an enormous pickerel. And if you've ever seen a pickerel, they've got that jaw that juts out, and it's their fill of the teeth. And Vaynermirnin wins, and he takes the jaw off the, pick, the pike, and he strings, uh, uh, puts strings on it, and that becomes the cantile. So in this one, you will hear the cantile, and you will hear the beginning of that story. <laughs> I think if uh, you have a chance, that was Arto Rinne uh, singing, and if you have a chance to see him this summer, um, keep an eye on the Center for Circumpolar S Studies page, but we'll certainly be, make sure that people know about it. Now we're going to actually go, this is a woman from the UP in the United States, but she has, a, although her name's Ruth McKenzie, um, she, her heritage is Finnish, and she was able to go back um, actually in the last decade um, if any of you attended Katie Trout's uh, discussion of uh, fiddling in Sweden and Norway, you know about the real strong uh, music education and music opportunities that exist in Scandinavia. So Ruth McKenzie was able to take advantage of these, and she went and uh, collected a lot of songs, um, but in her case she had many uh, extant examples to draw from. And she's taken and translated quite a lot of them herself. And um, really interesting kind of performance. She'll use her own voice and use that as the amplifier. And um, we'll hear the beginning of this. This is Aino's complaint. Aino is the beautiful young woman in the Kalevala who is to wed Vainamarinen. And Vainamarinen may be a really great musician, but he's an old man, and she's not too keen on it. So she's complaining to her mother about this. And she says, these are the words, Oh my mother, you who bore me, surely there is cause for grief.
CD is still available, so um, you might enjoy it, but it's, all of it is very beautifully taking that Kalevala me meter, but adapting it to a um, uh, solo voice, but still using the words, however, in English. Now we're going to uh, have, uh, this is Telu, who is a young and vibrant musician. She's played in many different bands, um, but here she's, a, uh, she's leading the performance. This comes from a CD called Wizard Women of the North. Well, it was produced by Northside Records. So it's no longer in existence, but they did some fantastic work. And this is called an incantation. If you know anything about uh, the sort of northern history, you know that the Sami were uh, thought to be able to uh, call up winds at will. And having a Sami wizard or a Finnish wizard was considered to be something that gave you power on the seas. So this is actually an incantation for the wind. And the word for wind in Finnish is tuli. You can hear tuli. Oops, sorry. <laughs> might be able to get the idea that they um, are able to call up a little wind or a, a middle wind or a great wind or a huge tempest and the incantation gets faster and faster and more and more intense as you go through. We're going to turn our view northward and we're going to look at Yoik and um, the Sami people for whom this is a traditional uh, singing uh, technique. Um, are traditional reindeer herders. This was taken this summer. I was in Lapland and I was lucky enough to have a white reindeer cross my path, so I felt uh, really gifted myself. And um, this, uh, w this reindeer was actually one of a larger herd. We don't see the herd here. We're going to hear a little yoik from, collected from uh, Sweden. Um, in the, again, in the, this one's in the 1930s. And um, this is characterizing the reindeer grazing land. So it is uh, trying to give you a sense of this place that you see here, a place like this. <laughs> considered to be very individual. It belonged to the singer. Um, most uh, Sami, as they came into their own personality, were given a yoik. One would be made for them. They never could sing it, but it was all whenever they, it was sung, you knew who it was about. So it was very, uh, very tightly entwined with the whole Sita family herding tradition. <clears throat> And most often, yoik was either sung outdoors um, without an audience or in some very small uh, aguahti, uh, uh, sod hut, or a lavu, uh, 
what would be a TP in North America. Um, so m in many cases, the, um, the performance of a yoik was very quiet. However, um, with the advent of Lutheranism and the increased missionization of Sami lands, um, one of the things that they, the, the missionaries strove to do, do was to eradicate shamanism, the drums, and to eradicate yoiks. So it became, um, it, it became actually illegal to yoik in public. And often you would find uh, people, Sami, who had been plied with drink and they would be very rowdy and singing these songs really out of context. And so the, uh, the reputation of the yoik went way downhill. And this would be in the time that these were being collected, the people who were doing this were really making a statement, look, this is, this is the way a yoik is and we're consenting to have them recorded because we want people to understand what they are. We're not all drunks. We're not all uh, rowdy, crazy people. And I think the kind of the sense of this place, this very comforting, wonderful place. Um, the singer here was uh, Johann Peterson Ragnarfjell, and uh, it was collected in Eireplog in Sweden. And we're going to go um, this time to Jokmok, and Siga Koyok is the singer. She, she um, it, and the, the name of this one is Tending the Reindeer. I'm sorry I can't tell you where this photograph is from. It's been circulating lately without attribution, but was so beautiful that I had to put it in here. Because here they are, they're tending the reindeer, and I think you will get the, I like to think that the woman in the back is singing this song. many yoik or traditional yoik. Um, there are sounds that are often repeated and uh, amplified and uh, variations, but uh, the, you know, the idea of um, uh, poems that are p lyrics that go with the, uh, the yoik is not necessarily part of, of the th matter. Um, so now we're going to look at uh, the yoik and how it has kind of uh, really changed in contemporary settings. And um, in the United States, right alongside the civil rights movement, the Native American Renaissance brought to attention the idea that there were enduring and um, uh, powerful um, ways of adapting Native American identities and people were using song, they were using literature, they were using poetry, they were using theater, they were using film. And out of that came the first Council of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations. The Sami were very eager to be part of that. They were uh, actively resisting um, the Norway's um, actions to build dams in North Norway. It was called the Alta conflict. And, um, and uh, environmentalists and Native Americans were also part of that uh, protest. But the thing that happened at those protests is suddenly young, peop young Sami who had had to go to boarding school, who had had to speak Norwegian, who had had to speak Nor uh, Swedish, who had had to speak Finnish, fully educated in their home countries, but having uh, grown up with their own traditions being uh, illegal, were beginning to sing their own songs and to um, adapt them also. So in this picture, what we have, this is Kevisieli, the guy who made the map, 
And this is Niels Oslak Valkepa, the poet that I've studied. Um, and that's Buffy St. Marie, uh, who uh, grew up, uh, was adopted from her Cree family into an American family, and um, has gone back to those Cree roots. We'll come back to Buffy St. Marie towards the end. But I think this is a very interesting gathering. This was uh, actually in uh, Minnesota. So you saw some of the beginnings of uh, the, uh, the kind of pan-indigenous movement coming out of uh, protests against key, key environmental uh, depredations. And we will see some of that too with Idle No More, the current native uh, Canadian First Nations protests in Canada. And we'll see that at the end. But what we have here is a song that was written by Niels Aslak Balkepad, also known as Ilohash. And um, it is in this, I can pass this book around, but this is the Sami songbook that the kids learn. But before this book was published, there was no collection of songs for the Sami. So here you have it. And um, the song is um, right here on page 28. So if you want to look at it, it's quite a nice songbook, and it's um, put together by Ule Edström, who uh, talks about the ideas of folk world uh, fusion music. This is called uh, Sami Yetna Duadari, uh, the, the lands of the tundra are our homeland. going on in this little piece. Um, you've got people uh, performing uh, for an audience, performing to be recorded, performing to be uh, have their music distributed. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here is it wasn't traditional to have men and women sing together. So, but these, uh, these uh, the group that, uh, the two that are here, Isla Hush and um, I can't think of her name right off, but it may come to me. But um, they had gone to school together, and they'd sung folk songs, you know, folk songs from the protest movement, and in, in, they'd sung Bob Dylan together. And they, so they were accustomed to singing together and to then bring in their songs and to make their music out of it was a pretty radical thing to happen. We're going to now look at Mari Boyne, whom I hope many of you know. Um, but if you don't, she's really easy to find. Um, many um, you can find her on YouTube. Many CDs available, and um, she is a consummate performer. Where uh, Niels Oslak Valkepa Ilohash was kind of a reluctant performer. He would perform if asked, but he wasn't a trained musician. She came to it and she went for music, and she came out of that same music education that Telu, the woman who did the incantation about the winds, she had the same kind of uh, background. So she came really well educated. And we're going to hear the beginning of a uh, song called Gula Gula. It says, listen, listen, listen to the voices of our foremothers, because they're telling us we have to pay attention to the earth. You'll hear some drumming. You'll hear some yoiking where they're just uh, vocables. You just hear the sounds. But the main, they, there are words. There are words that work in the same way that you'd expect lyrics in a Western song to work.
take you to some of <clears throat> the lyrics for this, you get a little bit of um, a sense of um, this. <laughs> time deciding what to choose from Mari Boine because um, she does she often performs with a set of African drummers that are fantastic um, she likes to use other world traditions um, but this one features her voice and a lot of the uh, yoiking that I've talked about but she has just recently declared that I don't want to be known as a Sami singer I want to be known as a world singer I don't want to just represent my, my background. I want to be part of this larger world. So in many ways, she's a very transformative figure. Um, she will be part of this Ridu Ridu, which is the indigenous, international indigenous festival that takes place in uh, Lapland uh, every year. And this year, it will have Mari Boine, and it will have Buffy St. Marie, and it will have a number of the other people that uh, we're looking at. But I think this is a very interesting feature where if you looked at how the Sami were outlawed from using their voices, here we have a place where there is an international indigenous festival with pretty much the program pretty much filled and you get a lot of lot of activity going through it. It will be broadcast um, on Norwegian and Finnish and Swedish television and there will be YouTube segments all, all the way along. So from going from this very quiet, uh, contemplative, kind of place-based performance, we're going to big stages that are actually in the world. And that takes us to Siberia in the Olang Ho and Isyak tradition. As I mentioned at the beginning, Olang Ho is an epic tradition among the Sakha or the Yakut. Um, in the uh, Russian Far East. Um, they are one of the larger populations of indigenous peoples in um, the Russian Federation. Um, I believe the population is around 350,000. So this is a, you know, rather some, some populations are several hundred or several thousand, but they've got a pretty vibrant uh, number of um, Saha people. And in their republic, um, their language is uh, being taught and um, being spoken on the streets and in the universities and the cafes on the theater. So um, you're looking at a um, northern native tradition that is um, not dying, but um, it's taking on some very interesting new forms. Um, this young woman here in the corner is an Olan Hokut which is a reciter of these epics. And not many of them are written down, and there are only a few that have been translated in fragments into English. So I don't have very good examples, but I do have an example of a uh, Olan Kokut who was uh, recorded in the 1950s. The uh, performance that you see up here is Isyak, which is Midsummer, St. John's. 
um, and there are enormous festivals um, in um, Yakutia. Um, and you can see that people come in costume. These are almost the equivalent of Native American powwows. And the dance that you see here, Linda, you want to come up? Can you, can you come and be my, uh, <laughs> my, uh, so um, we actually need one more person. How about Papu too? So this is, uh, there are a number of holes, but this is the basket hole is one that you often have. And if you're going to be doing Isyak, you want to be going with the sun. So we want to be going a little bit this way. But it's bend up, step together, bend up step together, bend up, step together. And we could have more people do this later, but um, I think you'll hear the pattern is very similar to um, the Kalevala epic. And it's really fun when you get a huge circle doing this and everybody's going and it starts to take on a life of its own. Thank you. So we'll hear uh, Zverev, uh, who is also known as Ayunsky, and he, I better turn this down because he has a massive, big voice. <laughs> This is actually an invocation, and it's, uh, t it's uh, talking about uh, tomorrow morning, and it's uh, uh, what you, s what, although it's, it would have been sung right at the um, rising of the sun, and, and of course when you're far in the north, the sun will be rising at some unusual hour like 1.30 in the morning. But this is the greeting to the sun. Um, this is Aya Han, and uh, that Han is like Chinggis Han, that's someone who's elevated. This group is uh, especially noted. They've gotten a lot of prizes in Europe in competitions. And um, the woman that you see her, here, her name is Albina Degtareva, Degtareva. And um, she is a really beautiful performer. Um, I, you can see her on YouTube if you like, um, but um, this, uh, this little piece is the white crane. The little thing that I have here is from when I was in Yakutia, and it's the white crane that is their um, emblem. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> made out of uh, mammoth ivory. So anyway, so there's the white crane, and here is the white crane also. that you hear in the voice is very um, um, characteristic of the singing in that area, especially when it comes out of a folk tradition. And um, as I kind of spoke about earlier, one of the things that uh, the Soviet Union did was to have these palaces of culture. 
even in quite remote places. And they tried to cultivate uh, dance troupes, song troupes, uh, theater performances, and use of the homos, the, the mouth harp, was part of what they would do. But uh, also the elaborate costumes that you saw Albina wearing, um, those are part of the tradition that the Soviet Union actually really um, liked to have that because it was one of the things they could sell. They could sell abroad these uh, ethnic performances. So they would often bring um, uh, uh, up and coming artists and um, musicians from the villages into these troops and take them touring as a way to move things. Now these people, these are uh, Claudia and German Hatalayev. They're the ones whose uh, film we would have watched if, uh, it, if it had made it with the wood bison delivery, but um, it didn't. So <clears throat> I was able to download the MP3 album of Arctic Spirit. And they are extraordinary musicians. I got to see them. They were uh, performing in Toronto and I had a Skype call with them and I got to see them uh, perform and uh, you, you would have sworn these animals were right there with them. There was a dog and a horse and I don't remember what else, but you, you could, they really, really felt like they were there. So um, here we have, this one's called The Voice of the Shaman. <laughs> Well, you can hear there's a stringed instrument that's only got like three strings on it. It's a long one. I can't remember the name of it. Um, there is a little mouth harp in this one. But the probably the most compelling part about this piece is her voice. And that pattern that you uh, heard in the um, Invocation to the Dawn, you have that same one. It's very hypnotic. And also in that dance, it's very hypnotic. So um, in terms of uh, shamanic trances, these, this kind of music was part of that tradition, which is really interesting to see now in the 21st century is some uh, new shamans are taking on this music as part of the tradition and using it for healing uh, practices. That would be a whole nother um, talk, but there are definitely shamanic elements in all of the music that I'm showing you. I'm going to have a little piece here from, um, from Tuva, um, the Inner Mongolia. And this one, it was a CD that was produced actually at Dartmouth. Um, the group is called Shu, and the CD is called Voices from the Distant Step. <laughs>
stop it after the throat singing part, but you could hear a drone. There is actually this group, I think there were five men in it, um, but some, m often throat singing is, it, it's, you're not singing against somebody else's body as the resonator, it's in your own body. And uh, so they worked, uh, worked as a group, but not um, as uh, a pair of singers. But when you get to Canada, and you see uh, throat singers, um, it's very likely that it's going to be women as opposed to men, and that you're singing very closely. These are cousins, uh, Tanya Tagak Gillis, um, who has performed with Bjork and uh, been all around the world, and her cousin, Selena Kaluk. Um, this is a song called Sina. <laughs> of the sound is uh, unfamiliar to most ears. It's hard to listen to it because it doesn't meet m most of our Western expectation. There's something about a yoik that's somehow uh, pleasant or some of the things like the white crane with the um, homos, you can imagine what it's like. But the roughness of throat singing is something that is really otherworldly. And it's uh, an extraordinary, p to see uh, to see young women perform this and have these rough voices come out of these beautiful mouths is an amazing thing. Um, we're going to look, listen to a little collection here. This was uh, collected by Jean Mollery, who uh, wrote The Last Kings of Thule, um looking at uh, being in the northernmost parts of Greenland. But he traveled all over uh, North America collecting uh, stories and songs. And this one is, um, if you've watched any of the films that came out, came out of Izuma, um, the fast runner Atanarjwat, for instance, um, you will actually recognize this song, which is a very um, uh, sweet little song in a way. But like a yoy, it would have been performed solo in a very intimate, space or outdoors. <laughs> Like Yoy, Inuit singing um, tends to use vocables, so repetition of sound that is supposed to be expressive of a feeling. Um, this one you can hear um, uh, in, um, th there's a film from Azuma called Kagik where they have a winter uh, uh, party igloo, essentially a Kagik is a party igloo, and uh, you hear this song uh, quite often. And then you hear often the women uh, interjecting something into it. But it would be a familiar, uh, f a familiar song. Now we're going to hear uh, Lucy Idlaut, um, who has been named in 2009 as the National First Nations Spokeswoman. And uh, she uh, is from the west coast of Hudson Bay. This song is a rough song. It's called E5770, my mother's name. And when um, Inuit were resettled off the land in the, after World War II, many of them did not have names. Um, or they would have the names of their grandfather, the woman would have a name of her grandfather or, 
or a baby would have the name of an uncle. So there was no way to tell if there was a boy or a girl or who you belonged to. So they tattooed all of them with their names on their forearms. And uh, her mother's name is E5770. You had, here she's taking a uh, recording of her mother and working that into her song. So this is definitely fusion. She's taking a different kind of recording and making a different kind of music out of it. I could do a whole talk about how contemporary northern native people are using rap and heavy metal and other types of music that we think are foreign to these beautiful pristine northern reaches but one of the things that has uh, proved to be very uh, truthful is that uh, using different um, genres of music makes the, the, uh, the content of the songs much more powerful, especially for young people. There's a great story of a young rapper from uh, Inarisami, uh, which only, there are only 350 people speaking Inarisami right now. And um, it, the hardest thing with a dying language is, will the children speak the language? So this one kid really liked to rap, and he would rap to everything that was on the radio. And his father knew it was one of the elders who was keeping the language alive, but they would talk about it, and then they would play with rap themselves. And, and, and finally he said, well, why don't you, in the next talent show at school, come and rap? And the guy was a smash success. And he has amok. He came in performed at a University Arctic event, and he, everybody was up there dancing, but he's using Inari Sami, this language of only 350 people. And the thing that was really, really cool about that story is that it wasn't just the young people that were coming out, it was all the old grandmas and uh, uh, old uncles and things. They were coming out to see it because he was embodying their language and taking it to the next generation. So, and Lucy Idlaut does that. She also does some beautiful throat singing and she does some very traditional singing, but I chose that song kind of for its content. This group is uh, one of, the, they were a consummate performers. Um, and these uh, three young men here are half Yupi, half uh, African American. Their father was stationed in the Aleutians, and their mother was there in service for, of some kind, and these boys were the result of it. So they grew up uh, playing drums of both kinds, Yupik and uh, African-American drums. And um, Karen Miller is a uh, Kalalisu from Greenland, and until she joined the band, um, they really didn't get gigs outside of Bethel, Alaska. But when she uh, did it, they really made a lot of um, performances all over Scandinavia. We'll just hear a little bit of this, but you can tell they like being on stage. <laughs>
So even though it's got this driving beat and it's been amplified, if you listen to the words, you recognize something in that awa uh, piece that Jean Mallory collected in Glulik. There's something of that same familiar words. They are really great performers. And then um, we're going to uh, finish up by looking at drumming. And as I say, we really could look at drumming all around the circumpolar world because probably the drum is the most important instrument of all. But I want to focus on Cree, <coughs> Cree drumming in particular. The Cree are uh, um, Algonquian people that are spread all across uh, Canada um, and into uh, Quebec and Labrador. And uh, there are about uh, 10 different dialects, but you can, t neighboring dialects can speak with one another. But uh, the idea of having uh, the drum as one of the key uh, tools that welcomes people, that heals people, that uh, makes for uh, celebrations and ceremonies, makes for farewells. And this image comes from uh, just yesterday. If any of you have been following Idle No More, the uh, protest movement in Canada, the First Nations protests against Stephen Harper's uh, co-option of environmental um, securities for waterways in Canada, and also which would make it possible for the uh, Keystone Pipeline to go through a lot of native places. Um, this, uh, this protest is part of that. And as uh, from the village of Wapangusti, which is on the east coast of the Hudson Bay, um, one of the northernmost Cree communities, young man um, said, I need to go to Ottawa. Um, and, and his friend said, we'll go with you. So they got their snowshoes and they went 1,600 miles and they made it to Ottawa yesterday. And um, they're pe these are the Nishuyu walkers and this is uh, taken by Garrett Conover as they come into Ottawa to the Houses of Parliament. And of course what they're welcoming them in with is with drums. So this is a really, uh, you see, you won't read very much about Idle No More in the New York Times or any of the national media. You've got to go to the Huffington Post or the social media to find out what's going on. But it's just like the Egypt Spring. It, the, the, there are really important things going on and the drums are part of that. We'll hear a little bit here from Buffy St. Marie. Um, Americans claim her because she was adopted uh, to an American family and went to private schools and had a life of considerable privilege, but she went back to her Cree origins and has tried to use those in her music. This uh, CD called Running for the Drum came out in 2009 and um, it received what is called the Juno Award, which is for the award for Aboriginal music in Canada. Um, there are other really interesting music awards around the world, but I will just mention that one for right now. And this is uh, Cho Cho Fire. that we're going to hear is Asani, again a Cree group, um, although two of them are Métis. Métis means that uh, you have a portion of your heritage is First Nations and a portion is uh, European Canadian, um, but it's a recognized First Nation Métis. Uh, um, two of them are uh, Cree and Métis, but the really interesting thing about Asani is that they grew up in musical households. They're one of them, uh, I think it's the woman in the middle. Her mother was part of a, 
a very popular band, and another one uh, had family that sang in the church choir. So they grew up with music around them. I heard these people um, at a University of the Arctic conference in Edmonton, but they sang O Canada, and they sang it in Cree. Mm -hmm. but they're going to sing, uh, the, uh, this is the rattle dance here. discussion, but I'm going to play a little piece for you and ask you to think if you can tell what tradition it comes from. And in the meantime, I'm going to invite Papo to come up and open that magic box there. <laughs> that takes her a little while. So listen to this piece and see if you can tell me what it is. It's the same one we heard at the beginning. See if you can tell me what you, what you think it came from. <laughs> Yes, but it's not right. No. Why did you think that? Well, I thought it was, um, I, I, maybe I, I, was, I was visualizing the uh, dance, the circumpolis. Oh, absolutely, the yeah. The dance, yeah. A, a beautiful resonant voice that then. Yeah, I could see that. It's not, not no. so. Right. The, before the real singing started, the, the more rhythmic part reminded me of the um, women doing the throat singing. Yeah, yeah. The one where the, there was a picture of a horse or something. I don't know what this thing was called. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about it, and, and, the, and the slide you had the horse's face, but I'm not sure what the name of the scene was. Yeah, that's a possibility too. <laughs> what? Is that a yoik? Why do you think that? Because well, the, the, that vocal part sounds like the yoik. The other stuff sounds very modern. Uh, Anybody else wanna? <laughs> It, it is actually uh, Sami, it's Vim Mesari, and um, he is an innovator. Yeah, he'll play didgeridoo, he'll play bongos, he'll um, try anything. He does know how to throat sing. So <clears throat> you've got a perfect example. Almost anybody could have been right, but he's coming out of a Sami tradition. And um, the idea of taking on um, other uh, world traditions and incorporating them for himself, he's an incredible innovator. And um, I think you see that more and more with Mari Boine stepping back and saying, oh, um, I don't want to be known as a Sami singer. I want to be known as a singer. 
So the idea of uh, maybe your inspiration comes from that, but that isn't your um, sole d definition. I can have some, um, we're, we're gonna, Papu, who is my friend from doing Finnish things together, um, one thing I could say, <clears throat> and I didn't emphasize, but you can find many of the um, majority, uh, the music from the majority, uh, Finnish music will be reflected in Sami music. Sami music does make its way into Finnish music, although that's less, uh, less evident. <clears throat> but you can also see it with Russian music making its way into Karelian music, for instance. But um, have you chosen something you would like to well, play? Well, you mentioned Mexico. Yeah. So we have a really lovely uh, waltz tune, and of course a waltz uh, came from Central Europe, but it's got its own, um, its own um, finishness. <laughs> time for a couple of questions. Uh, it's getting a little bit, it's gotten dark. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Uh, I just want to say that my husband and I went to Norway last year on one of those cruises up and along around and stuff. And then we got up into where the Samis were. They had this very touristy thing. But they do have, the Samis now, they do learn Sami and Norwegian and English. And so they speak the three languages. And they uh, uh, let them get out of school so they can you know, chase the reindeer when it's time and stuff like that. So they are making allowances for their traditions. It, and this is a really important um, uh, cultural change. If we had looked uh, back 30 years ago, before the Alta conflict, before, you know, that picture that we had of Buffy St. Marie and Isla Hosh and Kefaseli, before that, uh, to own land in Norway, you had to uh, have a Norwegian name. You couldn't have a Sami name had to have a Norwegian name. You had to uh, be, uh, you, you could not um, uh, be, um, let's see, what was the other main thing? You couldn't vote unless you had a Norwegian name. Um, so there were a whole bunch of things and the whole um, kind of uh, assimilation policy was very active. But as a result of that, um, and it's, it really is a predecessor to Idle No More, those people who were protesting at Alta went to Oslo and they staged a hunger strike in front of the Storting and they sang their yoiks in front of the Storting. And, they, and Norway said, oh, wait a minute, we aren't the uh, culturally aware country that we thought we were. We're making some big mistakes here. And as a result, Norway has changed its policy. There is funding for uh, that little book that went around. That was funded by Norwegian uh, cultural funds for Sami development. Good points, yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed in the book that um, the notation is just very straight, Western music notation, but when you hear this, it's sung, 
there's a lot of ornamentation. Well, there's a you know, sort of scooping gestures with the voice, and which reminds me of the yoiks. So I'm kind of wondering, is that just, you just, you, you live the tradition and you just know how to sing the song because of? Um, that, that, I wish I were the musicologist now, I could respond to that, but I've heard people speak about this, and one of the things that they say happens once you publish things like that is all of those beautiful scooping, did you say? Yeah. Those kinds of, that ornamentation um, gets standardized. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a strange thing that happens, in a book like that makes things available, it has guitar chords, but a guitar isn't a traditional instrument. So there's some things that happen because of publication. That, uh, but um, when I was at uh, Sami University College where this was published, um, there were um, a set of about six girls who were taking their exams to become kindergarten teachers for Sami. They were, uh, had scholarship, and they had to choose their six favorite songs, and they were all pouring over this book. <laughs> Maybe it's, um, it's a little bit like a fake book. Like in oh. jazz, you have a fake book, yeah. which just gives you kind of the outline of the melody, and it's understood that you're going uh -huh. to learn the complexities of the melody but from listening to other people. Oh, that would be a great question to ask some students. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of true of any traditional music, probably. I know, like Irish traditional music, there's been huge collections that were made in the turn of the century in the 20s, and it's the same thing. If you follow the book, I mean, it's the notes, but it's not the way it's played. Yeah. Really. And, and I think similarly, uh, um, very often music, uh, the African American tradition, um, the music is very, very simple, but it's been adorned by the, uh, mm -hmm. the African American singers. Mm -hmm. Even our uh, national anthem. Absolutely. Well, I thank everyone for coming out. And if you want to come and see the CDs, I have them here. And if you didn't get a copy of the discography, I have some copies of that up here. But thank you very much. <laughs>